midway up Vancouver Island on a couple of those islands near Vancouver Island. Corvallis, upstate New York, that's where. More Arizona, California, Kyoto, I always love it when Kyoto is here, and then I can be there a little bit. Oh, look around, appreciate all those that are here in a very direct and poignant way. Everyone is here for each of each of us in our own practice. And if you look in the heart, you see that you're here to practice for the benefit of our mosaic Sunday sitting. I don't, I don't see any Australia. Yeah, I did. Good. There's Timmy. <laughs> so we have, um, in addition to myself, uh, Amanda is a steady presence and assistant. Darine today from New Mexico, and Pari, who just finished a, a self-retreat, and uh, she may offer a talk next week, and, and Jake uh, on the East Coast, who will give an offering today, after we, after we meditate, after we feel from within. So just starting with a sense of doing nothing, changing nothing in particular, like a sense of settling and more of a initially a, a periphery or peripheral awareness, not going after something in particular like a sensation in the breath or the hands. Let's just see what senses you notice, first of all, with a soft approach, like soft eye consciousness and soft ear consciousness, soft sense consciousness, fragrance, flavor, body texture and soft mental landscape consciousness that not pulled into the variations occurring where there is analysis, interpretation, commentary, uh, drive to get or get rid of, to figure out And let that be like white noise in the background and more aware of the space around the mental landscape formations or just an attunement to formations themselves like long lines of ocean waves that you see across an immense bay. And rather than look for the particulars in those formations, it's like just feeling uh, 
the heft and the movement and the peak and the trough of these slow moving formations. You catch it in the mind this way and uh, it translates to much of our other sense experience. The body also really, really slows down. And therefore it's easier to notice areas of the body that are expressing sensations, perhaps connected to anxiety or some difficult emotion. But here right now, we're, we're not going into those. We're not going into the particular. We're, we're staying with the universal. Just attuning to where we can see and feel things from a much larger perspective, taking our time like slow foods. We collect all the ingredients from our local environment and it's as good of food quality as we can possibly get. And we prepare it mindfully with our own hands. And then we eat it very slowly with extraordinary presence and awareness. Not thinking much about the food, but the direct experience of taste flavor, fragrance, the visual display. Here we're trusting the capacity of our, our wisdom awareness to act quite immediately when a phenomena comes up that it's useful to be mindful of you know, a sudden thought form that maybe has the potential to take us down a trail of proliferation and further embellishing the story, things past or concerns of future. We have that deeply implanted in the body so that awareness, that wisdom awareness would just spring forth, notice the tendency and just not take the bait, not go that way this time. In this way, we're getting a, a wide angle view, a, a feeling, perception and understanding of our, of our system, just where it is, whatever we've come from in the last minutes, hours, or days. Whatever results, whatever, whatever effluence still spilling out from the thousand year year we've just had. From the many forms of practicing doing nothing that we've had due to conditions in the world. Perhaps new discoveries new realizations of the beauty, uh, the potency of doing nothing. How much of the rich qualities 
of our body and heart we've developed. So right in the midst of doing nothing, we suddenly just find ourselves abiding on the Brahma Viharas. One of them, two of them, all of them. Again, taking no specific path, no specific direction here. What is the, what is the body showing us right now? Without any push, without any use of memory or forecast. Until the, until the idea of doing nothing, full commitment. Isn't just the words, the two words, or the five words. It's, and it's not an idea. It gets to where we, we think it or we hear it, and there's just this letting go into the non-doing awareness stream, doing nothing. Uh, how does that feel? Sometimes through the, the beauty of our discipline, our commitment to practice, the, the breath shows itself in a magnificently clear way as as just breath, just breathing, as a source of great nutriment, oxygen, to our, our core center. And from the spirit of repetition, the tens of thousands of times we've learned to anchor in the present moment, we might find ourselves aware of the breath, of its characteristic, of its nature and of what we know to be its life-giving source to the system. At the same time, we feel remarkably aware, standing in presence, fully aware. Still just doing nothing. All that we need to know is, is revealed in the moment, including knowing itself. No requirement 
for rumination or comparing. And our remarkable skill then to discern the physical from the mental, the pleasant from the unpleasant, and the neutral. And the various emotions, some light and uplifting. some weighty, and confusing. Staying centered with this doing nothing awareness. So there's no, no preference for the light, the uplifting, the illuminating, invigorating, or calming. No need to move away from the weightier, bewildering, enmeshing, most importantly, we try to see how all of it, in every case, has the same nature. All the experience arises, flourishes for a moment and vanishes. But without remainder even the awareness that is noticing drops away. A new moment of knowing awareness arises. With new phenomena, physical or mental, in the field of awareness. As explorers, please see for yourself.
some of us has been practicing what Sayada Upandita calls the free flow, natural mind. Just setting any sense of form aside and uh, having the confidence of anchoring in really in anything, maybe outside the ordinary, outside the breath and body. Uh, a lot may be going on in the body, but just as a curiosity, as an experiment to intentionally find secure, safe havens uh, in space, in sight, in sound, not the particular, more the universal. Thus, the soft gaze of the beginner's mind, soft ears, We're not looking to stitch sounds together and into some kind of coherence, just that hearing base and being able to anchor there and feel connection and feel uh, some of the formations of the body and mind calm due to that external base, external anchor base. So in the periphery of my eyes, I settled on a Zafu, a, a yoga mat, a guitar, an ukulele, a stone. Knowing the objects were there, but not staring at them. And then having a discursive relationship with it, just allowing it to be what it was without mental embellishment. Sometimes that's necessary when a lot's going on in the body uh, and we choose not to dissociate in other ways that shut down our system, which sometimes we, we do do out of necessity, but more just let the body chaos move ahead and and find other external anchors like space and visual expressions, and auditory sound formations. And just being with that, sometimes as if we're not looking and by putting our attention elsewhere, but keeping it anchored in the present, a deeper part of our wisdom body uh, dismantles, dismantles the bundle of the sense of solidity and entangled emotions, uh, identification with that stuff and attachment to it, it just, it just happens by itself. And it's very freeing, very liberating, not to have to feel that I did it. You know, because that's a, that's a form of identification right there. You know, we, just, we just spread our awareness. And like neuroplasticity, we let our system rebuild take care of itself. So in the last couple of minutes, you can choose if you like to be direct, 
directive to intentionally call up one or more of the Brahma Viharas uh, to come to a closure with this Sunday Sangha sitting. As I've suggested in the past, and just go to one or two and practice them side by side or together or call them up one at a time and see which one seems to settle where. You know, around the neck or in solar plexus or in the belly or throughout the entire body. And that's the one. For example, the, the, the soothing and sweet care of compassion slowly, like a slow moving waterfall, wash through the body. And perhaps the next slow moving waterfall is equanimity. a deep sense of cleansing, acceptance. The, the deepest anchor, the anchor of imperturbability. That is a, it's not whipped around by what's alluring or what's repelling. Its nature is to stay in the center. See how that is for you. I've lost my colleagues so deeply into equanimity. They can't see me giving the ring the bell signal. <laughs> no more bell, that's why. <laughs> <laughs>
Salt Spring Island. Portlock. <laughs> Quinn. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, <laughs> Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> cool. Who's there? <laughs> Nanaimo. Maui. When, when we finally meet again in a real retreat, we'll know so much about each other's homes <laughs> and habits. <laughs> Please, Jake, whatever Dhamma offering you have for us, we're, uh, we're waiting. In <laughs> Me too. Great interest. Appetite. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good appetite for your Dhamma nourishment. Mm. So last... Um... Last Sunday, I couldn't come because of this sit because I was with my family and another family who um, we're good friends with. And we haven't uh, left the island hardly at all. We're on Martha's Vineyard. We haven't left the island hardly at all in a year, which is not our usual. But we went and drove a couple hours and went to a small ski mountain, still within the state. So we're within our COVID boundary. Um, it was a really kind of magical time. It was really lovely to just drop everything. My daughter has been doing Spanish on this app. What is the app? But she got her hundred day mark and everything, so she she was very proud of herself. But even that app she dropped during our little four day ex excursion. So I also decided, in honor of that, I would drop all all obligations, and I didn't I didn't come to the sit. So I was listening to it later. I was listening to Darini's and instructions, dropping us in, and I was listening to Stephen's talk about the sacred space of receiving his vaccine. You guys can hear me, yeah? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I heard how Stephen started with this description of Donna in that sacred space, the giving and receiving and ended up with a, concluded with a, a beautiful entry into the aspect of intention in our practice. Right? The heart of karma, there's this saying in the numerical discourses <clears throat> in the early Buddhist text, it's chaitana that I call karma, chaitana ham bhikkhuli kamam madam. It's the intention, the motivation behind the action that is the planter of, of act, seeds of action that give fruit, good and bad. So I had this idea that I would start with intention that I would talk about when my daughter 
is given cookie say her first thought is to share it with her brother it's not always his first thought but that's definitely <laughs> her first thought and um how the steve that the house that steve is in now uh, when i showed up there it was totally given to me selflessly as a space to grow and a shelter at a time when I needed it. Nourishment in Dhamma and in Hawaii. And I, I once gave a, a, a talk with Steve, I think it was at the lake where I mentioned this beautiful quality in my daughter and this beautiful quality in Steve, that kind of giving intention, that Donna intention. And also thinking of my granddad, my mom's dad, just a really powerful Donna Parami, a really powerful cultivation of giving in all these three beings in my daughter and in Steve and in my granddad. So my plan was to segue from that honoring of that Donna intention in my daughter Mira and in Steve and my granddad Jerry. And then and talk about intention in the practice and, and how the practice can purify our intention. And it seemed like a really good idea for a talk. But then I got really scared. <laughs> so that's where I was this sitting when Stephen was talking about feeling the tension in the body and finding a neutral anchor, a place to rest. That's where I was planning and fear, planning and fear, <laughs> planning and fear. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not sure what to talk about anymore. <laughs> now I think maybe if you helped me, I could take questions and then I bet I'll have something good to say. <laughs> I hope that's okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there any Dhamma questions that practice well, questions? I have one. So, when do you know that an outside anchor? might be more skillful means, more helpful, outside hang, anchor being like, you know, going to my red Zafu or sitting yoga mat or the, um, the grapefruit on the counter and just kind of to anchor there uh, because in here is, is anxiety or fear or a feelings of um, unworthiness, shame, whatever, a hodgepodge. <laughs> At other exactly. times, I might go through them, feel them, touch them, know their sensation, know their feeling tone, uh, and see if I can make space for them right where I might be feeling them in the body. Um, how do you determine when to do, when to stay with it there with that phenomena or to kind of in a skillful way turn your back on it and anchor somewhere else? As I think I was suggesting in part of the instruction today. You were, I heard you. <laughs> 
I just I want to know, did it work? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> and, and to add to that, as you suggested, it's, it's always fascinating to me that how, how the Buddha made clear that that chaitana and kama are the same, mm. you know, and the, the implications of that, the reverberations of that, the the poignancy of that, the value of it. We've had this little exchange about Krishnamurti after Stephen mentioned him in, in a talk a few weeks back. And I've been thinking about it a lot since then and just this being guided by this uh, aspiration to rest in just a really lucid, clear, loving, awareness um, so I'm holding the practice for myself like whatever tools I'm using especially the idea that okay now I'm practicing and now I'm not <laughs> especially that idea but also the tool of okay directing the attention to the breath, using labeling, or, um, you know, curiously investigating the anxiety and fear and shame. Or, like with the instruction that you gave, resting in a different object could be sound space. Or turning the attention, um, to an external object, or as you suggested at the end, calling in one of the Brahma Viharas, for me, really joy is such an access point that even in the midst of the anxiety and fear, I can, because I've had the opportunity and the natural inclination to really cultivate that, it really can call up and just refresh and rejuvenate. Um, so for me, this, like that specific instruction to turn the attention to an outer object wasn't working so well, but the calling up Brahmavihara, that worked. And also um, anchoring in sound. But the specific question was about knowing when when to make that subtle shift out of, out of a good intention, out of a beautiful heart of, of maybe caring for myself, when to use that subtle tool of shifting the attention. Um, so for me, it's, I was resting mostly in the and I was curious too about the feeling of fear and the oscillation between caught in the content and then aware of the sensations of the of that um, shifting, changing, dancing, tightness, mind and body. I was really interested in that oscillation, but I also um, wanted to hold this aspiration of there being enough evenness of mind, equanimity of, equanimity of mind don't to uh, allow that curiosity to bring wisdom to. So that there's enough calm and collectedness and evenness to hold the precision and courage and joy that wants to know. So if I, felt myself 
even curious, but not even enough, not enough of the equipoise, equanimity, groundedness. Then that's a time I would know to find a place to rest. It can be a place within, like in the way that you suggested, Steve, within present experience. So we're still seeing experience falling away. As soon as we're connecting with the seeing in that real way or the knowing of the seeing, you can feel that falling away. And even in the mind starting to take an object, whether it's a thought object or even in the turning of the attention itself, the gathering of the forces of the mind, even there. But finding that refuge wherever it is an experience that's neutral enough or pleasant in comparison to the unpleasant, that it gives that sense of refuge, even grounded. Uh, so that there's enough of that calm collected evenness to hold the, the joyous, courageous precision. And that way the experiences themselves can show us they're falling away, undependable, not mine, nature. Because <laughs> otherwise, too caught up to, to feel that. Does that answer the question? Clear. Yeah, very good. Thank you for the question. Any other questions that I could be helpful with? Practice. If you have a question, you can push the raise your hand button under reactions or participants, depending on what device you're on, and it can help unmute you. Richard? Oh, <laughs> there, there, there. there we go. I just wondered, uh, I was hearing these Hawaiian birds in the background and uh, I wonder if anyone know what they knew what they were because for some reason they just gave me a great deal of joy hearing them. I don't know, they got me out of my uh, cold funk today. Well, around here, uh, maybe it's different on Maui, but around here, there's uh, the northern cardinal and the red-headed cardinals, minor birds, some doves, and, and we have 11 chickens. Not exactly Hawaiian birds. But <laughs> 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 they make their own sound. Thank you. Yeah. How about Molly? Are you there? Did you have birds in your in your background uh, soundscape? Yes. Let me come on camera too. Yeah, and the same. They're the same birds. Exactly. I was glad to hear you say what <laughs> I'm aware of. We get a lot of cardinals in my in my world. They can withstand the crazy wind. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's a good image. Anchoring in the wind. Yeah. Some, some birds that are able to be with it. <laughs> we also get the cokey frogs. Yeah. Yeah, really, that, that was the point of the instruction. There's nothing that can't be uh, an anchor for meditation, a focus of, of our awareness. And it can often help us step outside, uh, you know, whatever configuration might be going on in our body, in our uh, heart, in our system. And so, yeah, just to take in the, the, the visual or, the, or some particular object like uh, the zafu or the guitar, the piece of fruit, mango trees like that. I can hold my attention for a long time. If it starts to go into thought, I just come back to awareness of seeing, which is one of our really important practices to not only be aware of the eye and the object of the eye um, and the eye sensitivity, but actually seeing consciousness, being aware of that, uh, letting the object fade and letting the not identifying with the inner sensitivity as I, like my eye, but just the phenomena staggering amazing, reverential phenomena of seeing that we can see. Mm. And we all see now, later on, maybe we can't see only in our memory, our inner, vi inner visions, you know, but now most of us can see pretty well. And same with sound, that we move away from identifying the object, you know, Northern Cardinal, Red-Headed Cardinal, Minor Bird, and so forth. Just kind of abide and rest in that, that staggering phenomena of the experience of hearing. You know, something, something our species developed in the last... Uh, million years or so, you know, light was already here. Light, light's four billion years old. So uh, light's around all the time, making it a really good anchor, being aware of light and, and not, again, not identifying with, I see that, just aware of seeing. But sound is something we've refined, you know, since we were, Pleistocene hunter-gatherers, Holocene farmers, and so forth. Then we've refined sound so much that sometimes actually we forget that um, it is causes and conditions that sound vibrations strike the inner sensitivity of the ear, and that sound, that's hearing consciousness, nothing else. Not my sound, or I heard that, you know, that's another level of conventional reality that helps us um, organize and navigate the day-to-day -day world. But in terms of internal meditative art, the awe, the reverence that we can have for our own senses, you know, just abiding in the awareness or knowing of hearing, period, in touch, if you like, with sound vibration, feeling that rumbling, feeling that movement in, in, the, in the ear, or in the chest, often sound I can feel in various parts of the body, and just keeping it on that level. There's something extraordinarily healing and, and nurturing about that using our, our senses as our path to freedom, to liberation, to perfect selflessness.
you have a question, Quinn? You're pointing to something that says yes. Can she unmute? Okay. Um, Stephen Shake, can a thought be anchored to? Thoughts, can they be anchored? Yeah, but only in their flowing nature. Um, the equivalent of freezing a thought is like having a, um, a disc of blue in one of the concentration practices where, where you focus on something like a candlelight or a disc of yellow or green or blue uh, and get so concentrated that eventually it's internalized. So that's a, that's, that's a conceptual practice. So you're borrowing for a time something that itself isn't permanent or static, but there it is. You, you, you first either see or visualize the external color and then internalize it. The, the similarities in the Brahma Vihara practice, you know, at, at first we, we um, um, visualize the easy person that it's effortless to feel love toward and trust a safe person. But eventually the idea is not to continually hold on to that. That object is serving, it's a conceptual object, it's a visual object equivalent to a thought. But then we internalize the feeling in, in, so that the metta then is in our heart. And then it can continue to all, to all beings or, or throughout ourself or however we, however we choose to direct it. So again, just to review, can thoughts be an anchor? If there's a stream of thoughts and, and you're pretty focused and you're pretty steady, there's enough equanimity, you can choose to be aware of the stream of thoughts the way you would be aware of a stream of sound vibrations. You don't go into the content because it'll sweep you away. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yes. Like good. just thoughts arising and going away. Yes. They can. Yep. Absolutely. Just as sound or physical sensation. That's it. Yes. Thank you. Stephen? Yes. I have a question. Um, it is what you just said about the stream of thoughts and vibrations and visual objects. Does that also apply to, um, I've been practicing a little more the way that um, you have recommended and everything becomes these little tiny particles and I was wondering more of what are those particles called? Cause I um, was just curious. And then do I just work with them as any other object? Thanks. Basically the answer to that is yes. Um, okay. But the particles, are they coming out of their, of, out of physical phenomena? Other senses like sound, like light particles or how would you say the particles, where are they manifesting from? Are they, they seem to be entirely mental particles? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, it, they seem somehow affiliated with um, the composition of the physical body when turning the senses inward. Hmm. Good. Oh. Then I would then I would say most likely they're they're primarily physical part physical particles. You you don't need to know which okay. are which are from the textures of the of bodily elements 
like uh -huh. earth element, water element, heat element, air element, or our sound vibrations, which is actually the earth element and the air element together making friction, making sound. None of that uh -huh. you need to know. Okay. It's all, they're, it's all, they're all related. N nothing can actually be entirely separated. They're all interconnected and in interplay, so to speak. So the, the idea of meditation is when we get quiet enough, the form breaks down. The form means the conceptual idea of a head, of shoulders, of an arm, of a torso, of legs, of a glass and so forth. So in certain places in meditation that uh, due to the continuity of awareness and concentration, then a, a wisdom awareness can arise and see nature as it really is. Those particles are nature as it really is. You're looking at reality. For a moment uh, there, it's like um, the, you, you've amped up and, and brought into real clear focus, uh, like a um, microscope suddenly brings everything very, very, very close. And, and you just see things coming together or falling away, or maybe yeah. you just see things falling away. You see it in different forms. But all the particles you see are what, when you're not in that meditative form of focus, you, you would be experiencing those particles as, as, your, as your arm or your hand, you know, or something in its full form. So it's just good to know the difference. It's, it's very powerful. It's very important to have that kind of experience because it, it means that your meditation is pro progressing and is capable of, of suddenly recognizing the nature of phenomena, that it's also transitory. It's also in its own nature of immediacy. That is it's immediately, it appears immediately it vanishes. Mm -hmm. Were you asking, like, is there anything more to do than notice that? That was my question, and it okay. was perfect. And um, w during your answer, I was also um, aware about the spaces in between the particles. Sometimes I like to kind of hang out, and 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 that's Good. okay. That's okay. Just don't be attached to it. Okay. That's that's a real okay. good thing. That's, that's really helpful okay. in, in further um, strengthening and forming and maturing the quality of insight that recognizes that all, all, all these phenomena are actually just hanging in space for a moment and then disappearing. And, and as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in that that interstitial space that our awareness can rest in the in-between things. So that's what you, exactly what you were doing. Yeah. yeah. You can do awesome. so much you can do. Think do it all. all. Anything you can do if you're aware, <laughs> just don't be attached. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> A question. Um, I'm wondering if either of you can speak to um, anything that either from the text or just like it, in the practice with regard to how to work with fear of regret. Um, and not so much fear of regret around like, because it, it seems to me like there's some capacity where fear of regret prevents you from doing something that's going to obviously harm someone, right? And, and that seems really clear. But 
when there are life choices that are coming up and maybe it can bring about doubt when it, I'm feeling kind of like stuck between choices or also sometimes feeling like it's driving like an, a really strong amount of craving for something to happen a certain way because of fear of regret um, or fear of like missing an opportunity. Um, wondering if you can speak to that. Okay, cool. <laughs> This isn't directly on it, but one really beautiful quality of the texts. Um, there's a scholar, Maria Hein, she wrote a book on Buddhaghosa, but one of the lines in there that I really appreciate is recognizing in these early Buddhist texts and the Pali texts, the presence of absence. So like adosa, non-anger, is metta. Mm. Um, and I thought of it because of the, the, the illustration that I often give of that is that having no regrets is not just not having regrets it's a really beautiful positive state <laughs> to have no regrets it's just not it's not a not having not just a not having something it's a really beautiful state that you're aspiring towards that I'm aspiring towards too of having no regrets mm. um, but I don't really know how to do it <laughs> that's the truth <laughs> uh, Amanda you said something about having having fear of having no regret no having, having fear, fear of regret having fear of regret so yes but then it's like, it, sometimes it seems like there are multiple good ways forward that aren't obviously harming, but then it, it's easy to kind of get caught um, or to feel like a lot of, um, you just like a lot of craving for it, for resolution or for like one way to, to happen a certain way or something. Mm -hmm. That can have, be really have you heard me talk about skillful remorse? I'm not sure if I've heard you talk yeah. about it. I think that, yeah, that I'm somewhat familiar with that in terms of that driving skillful behavior, I guess. But yeah, I'd be curious to hear. Well, for me, it's like pausing and using wise reflection and considering actions r recent or a long time ago, volitional actions, you know, particularly speech, uh, the spoken word or the written word, uh, are, are some behavior that caused myself and others harm. And then from this place here in the moment where I'm, at, where I'm calling up wise consideration bringing in the wisdom mind and reviewing those actions, those period are, are the people involved, myself or others. Um, and, and then making a wise assessment that, yeah, that, that was hurtful. That was hurtful to me. That was hurtful to that person. That was hurtful for both of us or for many of us. And, um, and then and then I make a resolve to not repeat that particular pattern or action uh, that may have been born out of anger or greed or ignorance. So I, I investigate it in that way. Where did it, where did it arise from? So then, it's, then it doesn't become mine. Mm more as Jake says, it's just, the, it's, it's dosa, it's anger. And then to, then to consider what the odd dosa is just the absence of anger, which is metta. And all lobha is the absence of greed, which is generosity or dana. And, and um, avidya is the absence of, of 
ignorance, bewilderment, confusion, not knowing, and, and especially the the not knowing is there in our actions because if we had the wisdom, if we had the clarity, we would not be able to act out of anger or out of greed. It's only with the veil of, of unknowing, of ignorance, of delusion that we can't see. We can't see our attachments and we can't see our ignorance. And we, we, then we do, we do something that's hurtful to someone. So in that review, we take good care to recognize that so, sometimes out of the conditions of, of greed or hatred, and especially delusion, an unuseful, unhelpful, inappropriate, or misguided behavior comes out mm -hmm. in word or deed. And then this present time reflection is sort of dismantling that pattern that habit pattern, whether it's once or whether it's a repeating one, it's the same formula. Mm -hmm. and, and then we do it. And then I think that's a, a wise thing to consider that in that in that Indian way, they use the negative a lot where, they, where they're talking about a dosa, which is unconditional love, mm -hmm. not just the absence of anger. Mm -hmm. Um, can I ask you, um, it sounded to me like the case you were talking about, you were experiencing a kind of indecision, mm -hmm. which you Keita in the Pali. Mm -hmm. experience a kind of feeling of being pulled this way and pulled that way and mm -hmm. and not sure which way to go and I'm wondering not so much on a conceptual level but like can you feel that right now can you is it happening now is it there mm -hmm. okay so what's the what's the general texture um like through my uh core is this it's a sense it's a sense of pull yeah um and i can get really there's a lot of thoughts and a lot of like that part can get kind of spinny but mm -hmm. in my center it's very um it's a it's a it's a pull a, a pull in a pull down outward Forward. Oh, outward. So, so you, you do recognize the doubt that's going on, as Jake suggested? Um, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, conceptually, that seems obvious, but the doubt part... Um, yeah, not to be too cryptic. Like we're we're working on trying to to buy a house, so that has been like really, just a lot of a lot of that like pull and strong desire and attachments, and then feeling like like this fear of like if it doesn't happen. So that's the like fear of regret piece. It doesn't seem like inherently something that's gonna. There's no right way to do it, but it is a sense of getting really caught. Um, what happens for me is I get caught in this, you know, fear of doing something wrong, of not making the right choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, that. Yeah. And there's Sounds a kind like of insatiable. Normal. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. I just said, it just sounds like you're a normal day-to-day, multiple hindrance attack. Multiple hindrance attack. <laughs> when, I'll, I think what I want to say is when, when that drops away, I don't, I don't have a, like a mechanism of making that drop away. Mm -hmm. But I notice 
that when that drops away, there's just a kind of equanimity with, I'm gonna make my best choices and then things are gonna unfold <laughs> and they're not all gonna unfold in the way that I want. That is the fact of the matter. They're just not gonna unfold according to my plan. Mm -hmm. It's not under my control. I just get to make my best choices based on imperfect information. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck with that. Amanda. Yeah, really. <laughs> I think there's a kind of wanting more than we can have that happens for me. Wanting more control than I have. <laughs> yes. And and like predictability and um yes. <laughs> yeah, and the truth is it's just not like that. <laughs> That's dukkha. <laughs> Yeah, and the idea, I think the place where I get caught is the idea, this is actually helpful. I've, it's like I'm processing as, as you're saying that, but the idea that if I do it right, then it'll be somehow in my control. That's exactly. the place where I get caught. That, and then I get stuck in the like, how do I figure out how to quite do it right? And how do I, that's, that's the caught place that I'm in this. And I think what you were saying, Steve, like the the ignorance or the delusion is that I can, that if I only do it right, then, then it'll work. Then you won't suffer. Then I won't suffer. <laughs> I have a mantra for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, may, may I have the courage to be perfectly imperfect. Mm. You don't know how many times during the day, during the week, I'm walking from one side of the house to the other. And I, I do generally very slow, mindful, semi Tai Chi, careful walk from, you know, a room behind the map to out here uh, into the kitchen, uh, out into the garden. Um, and, and within that, I, I see this all the time. I see all of you. I, I get a sudden quilt comes to my eyes like because you're my sangha. And so if I get a little forgetful or, or stumble a bit or you know, whack my toe on the chair or something like that and get halted and I want help, the, the first thing I go to is, you know, because like Michelle's in self-retreat, so unless I'm bleeding to death, I'm not gonna contact her. <laughs> I go here. I go to my quilt of lovely Sunday Sangha yogis from all over the world. It's really helpful. It's really helpful to know that, that not only each Sunday we meet here, but that you know we, we listen and we speak and we all sit together in that profound, silent stream of awareness and it really has an effect so so when i'm either needing a reminder or i have a realization and feel like well that was a real mindful move and i really felt that as i turned to go into the kitchen i still revert back to this room that that we create here every week somehow the room continues <laughs> I, I, open my, I open up my computer in the afternoon and I think, I think this is what I'm gonna see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can take a screenshot and put it there. Yeah, I know, I was just gonna ask, how do you take a <laughs> screenshot? What's how do it? you do that? Yeah, I have to look on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Command shift 
four, right? Yeah, command shift four. Command shift four. Okay, go, go take them, go. <laughs> Nothing. Command shift. Oh yeah, no, but look at your cursor, it's across now. Am I right? What? Is your cursor across? My cursor looks funny. Yeah, it is cross. Okay, now press your mouse. Sorry, everybody, do a real time <laughs> tech. <laughs> if you press and hold, then you can draw the rectangle you want to take the shot of. If I press this and hold? Yeah, press the funny oh, and then just cursor. open up to it, the whole screen? Yeah, just draw your rectangle and you'll get whatever rectangle you draw. You move the cursor to the upper left hand corner. And then bring it down to the right hand corner. <laughs> Command. I'll tell you that. I'll show you later, Steve. Here, I'll take a screenshot now. And then I'll send them to you. That's that's a good one. From yeah. Harry. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Any other technical or practice questions? We can yeah, the other page. <laughs> we'll have us in permanence. I have, I have friends on page two. <laughs> Take another one. <laughs> oh, command very, shift. There you go. This is a command very shift three does the whole screen. I never knew that. Class today. <laughs> Extremely important Dhamma class we've had today. <laughs> I didn't know that one, Jake. That's a good one. <laughs> well, I wish a dosa to everyone <laughs> and aloba and uh, aloha. Uh, Avija and Aloha. <laughs> so, Aloha means unconditional. The kind of generosity I was talking about last week, where it all comes together, giver, the gift, and the receiver, uh, and the, the uh, and the wisdom of that, the potency of that, and the knowing that that settles in as a strength, as an, as an inner Dhamma strength, when Dana is coupled with wisdom. And a uh, dosa that we're unified here in this, this the intimacy of unconditional love. And we bring that in our day-to-day -day practice and our week-to-week -week Sunday sit. The avija is what, what we've just been doing both through discussion and practice, it is the uh, the opposite of of um, confusion, bewilderment, ignorance, not knowing, re releasing the wisdom within. That is our essential work: the wisdom, the light of wisdom, that overcomes the oppression of delusion. So aloha, everyone, until we meet again. Take a look at all your compatriots from around the world. North, south, east, west. Some are in boats. Bridget, are you in a Ryokan in Kyoto? Did you go away already? No, she's there, but I don't think she can unmute. Bridget, I'm trying to unmute you. Oh, you're unmuted. I can hear you. Not are you in a Ryokan? <laughs>
You got remuted somehow. Oh, I'm. Uh, I don't know how. You I might have muted, 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 remuted her, Steve. There hey. we go. Now you can hear us. Yeah, this, <laughs> is, <laughs> this is our studio, my treatment room, meditation room. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Bamboo view. Yes. Yes, bamboo view. Perfect. <laughs> <gasps> Thank you. Thank you. Thank my you for letting you. Kyoto into my house. <laughs> Be well, everyone. Lots of love and care. See you next week. <laughs>